I'd like to ask you a question that's highly relevant to this video. Do you hate elves? It's a trick question, of course. You don't hate elves. Maybe you think you do, but you don't. You're probably annoyed with elves, sure. I mean, they can be arrogant as all hell, and that's pretty annoying, even if they're usually in the right. Real smug, those elves. Dwarfs might hate elves, but even their attitude probably occupies that same realm of annoyance most of the time. Like, damn those elves and their shoddy work ethic, that sort of deal. Half the time with dwarfs, it's just a rivalry kind of thing, not true hatred. Don't get me wrong, plenty of dwarves hate elves, and they're more than happy to be vocal about it. But overall, I don't think most of them hate elves. But imagine with me for a moment, if you took every single dwarf who genuinely hated elves and fused them into one being. Then go further. Take that one combined super hatred dwarf and give him the hate of every other being who has been wronged by elves for one reason or another. Maybe an elf killed their dog or something, why is it important? If you take this being and teach it to do nothing but hate elves for a thousand thousand years, how much rage it feels against the elves would be nothing, and I mean nothing, compared to the Elder Scrolls' very own Pelinal Whitestrake. This man hated elves. There are no words in any language, real or fictional, that could convey an iota of how much this man hated elves. And because I loathe the Mer for making a mockery of the otherwise perfect elven archetype, let me tell you his story. Pelinal Whitestrake was... Someone who doesn't sound much like a fantasy character when you first explain what he is, but I suppose half the shit in the Elder Scrolls doesn't sound like it belongs in a fantasy setting. Like the Empire's space program, and no, I don't mean what happens when you fight a giant too early in Skyrim. An actual space program, they had one. Anyways, this man was a time-traveling cyborg from the future who was also the incarnation of a dead god sent back in time to presumably ensure that the rebellion of men against the relevant overlord succeeded. Quite the description, isn't it? Admittedly, I couldn't find anything that expressly stated that was his purpose for going back in time, but as I keep going on, I feel like you'll come to agree with me on it. And his creator said he was based on the Terminator, which rather lends credence to that idea. His name comes from a couple of potential different places. White Strike is an easy one, it's because his hair was white as snow. But Helenol is a bit trickier. It's likely not his given name, although as a time-traveling demigod robot, his given name could be anything from John to HK-47 to General Tullius the 20th. Helenol itself is an elven name, though. And Pelinol was many things, but a fan of irony wasn't one of them, according to the books about him in the games. The name means either Glorious Knight or Star Maid Knight, and given that the A-Leads were having the heads of their entire race dunked into the toilet by Pelinol, it's not likely they'd be the ones calling him Glorious. Bit of a mystery his name, much like a lot of the stuff about the guy, but at the end of the day, it sounds badass and that's probably all the thought we need give the subject. Given the nature of anything involving time travel, and because of the fact that I couldn't find anything on which era he came from, I'm going to tell his history from the perspective of the timeline he showed up in. He first appeared very early in Tamriel's history during the Marethic Era, when the elves known as the Aelids still ruled over the land of Syrod. That should sound familiar, as indeed it was the land that would come to be known as Cyrodiil. At this point in time, it was believed to be a wild jungle, and the Aelids held a firm control over the races of men as slave owners. And they were not kind slave owners. Not that holding slaves is ever a kind thing to do, but the Aelids were quite happy to use their slaves for all sorts of nasty sacrificial business as these evil precursor empires tend to love. Lots of Deja Worship and all that horrid stuff, just to really go the evil bastard extra mile. I promise I'm getting to his story, but there's still some more context to be had. And his tale is interwoven with others as well, such as one Alicia. She was once nothing more than an A-Lead slave, but events transpiring in faraway lands would kickstart her journey to greatness. By that, I mean Skyrim started butchering elves like nobody's business. Ysgrimor is especially deadly to Elves' axe and apparently founded quite the bloodline, and one of his descendants named Harold had unified Skyrim into a realm of men and drove the Elves either out of the land or into extinction. Alicia had not only heard of this wonderful act of elven murder, but that the gods the Nords worshipped were much kinder to men than elves, so she prayed to them to send the nicest angel they had to help her out. The goddess Kinnereth sent a demigod bull man named Morahouse who thought she was hot as hell. You may notice if you've played Oblivion, the statues of Morahouse depict him as a regular dude. This is the skirt around the fact that Alicia fucked a bull. But moving on from that wonderful imagery, together with the bull friend with benefits, Alicia would rally her fellow slaves and become known as the Slave Queen, and the rebellion against the Aelids began. It went alright at first. Not great, because the Aelids were powerful, but they were also suffering from the effects of a civil war between Aedra and Daedra worshippers, and Kinnereth kept giving Alicia visions on how to best fight elves. But with the third of her visions, did she receive news of someone special coming? 
A man who would lead her armies to victory. A man who would make himself known covered in the gore of elves he ripped apart single-handedly. Finally, dear viewer, does Pelinal Whitestrake enter the picture? During the Morethic era, there were reports of him showing up somewhere, gathering armies and forming kingdoms, and then just pissing off to do it again before he finally showed up for good to greet Alicia. I wasn't kidding when I said he showed up covered in gore, by the way. He quite literally walked into Alicia's camp with a sword and mace both covered with elf intestines. He simply said that this was all that was left of their eastern chieftains who were no longer running their stupid elven mouths. Here's a map of Cyrodiil for you real quick. See the eastern bits of it? No more elves here. All of them dead because they made the grave mistake of existing in the same thousand square miles as Palinal White's Drake. Needless to say, he made a good first impression. It's also worth mentioning that Pelinal was immediately noted as having armor from the future time in the Song of Pelinal, and he had a killing light emanate from his hand. Now, whether or not either of these things are proof of his cyborg status, or if it was just armor from the time he came from, isn't strictly made clear. It's entirely possible that the killing light was just destruction magic, and as is shown in both Oblivion and Skyrim, the armor he wore was just plate armor, which at the time would have been unheard of in Tamriel except amongst the Dwemer. But either way, he made quite the entrance. Oh, and he also had the Amulet of Kings in place of a heart, just jammed into his chest. Now that is some magical cyborg shit right there. And from there, Pelinal Whitestrike proceeded to quickly get to work doing what we all know and love him for, murdering elves. And by the at the time only eight divines did he get to killing them with gusto. Although contrary to what you might think, initially he wasn't just the doom guy of elves. Instead of going full Cornate Berserker from the get-go, he made a point of leaving the bulk of the Elven army to his own forces. Instead, he would somehow get pre-arranged duels set up where he would challenge the enemy champions and leadership. The Aelids being elves, they arrogantly assumed they could handle this upstart human warrior. Shortly afterwards, he would slaughter the enemy champions and leadership. Now, the first few times this happens, I get it. We're in a fantasy setting, so maybe the first couple of guys hadn't heard about how he turned the entire eastern realm of the Aelids into a vacant parking lot. Maybe the guy who cast the long-distance message spells was just feeling sick that day. It can happen. But by the twelfth time this happens, what do you have to gain by accepting? Honor? Is it about keeping your reputation? Because the guy whose neck veins he ate probably kept neither. This is when he did that funny thing where he screamed the name of Reman Cyrodiil, by the way. Which is especially worth mentioning because of how it affects the whole time travel deal. Was he just a big fan of the guy? Did Reman or someone else send him back? Because if Pelinal was from a timeline where the Aelids were still in control, how the hell would he know Reman's name? And if that isn't the case, we get the situation where Pelinal was sent back in time from a timeline that was already won, so why bother sending him back? You know what? I'm overthinking it, and either way, it's incredibly badass. Also funny. Riemann didn't even found the empire that was going to come about from the slave rebellion, spoiler alert. That's several thousands of years later. Imagine Achilles screaming out George Washington's name at the Battle of Troy. This pattern of Pelinal killing the people in charge repeated itself several times across Cyrodiil. The names of most of the people he dueled aren't really important because they only exist to die by Pelinal's robotic hands. The guy whose neck veins he ate was called Haramir of Copper and Tea, and the only reason I'm bringing that up is because that is the dumbest name I think I've ever heard. Who calls themselves that without turning red from embarrassment? I am the Lord of Copper and Tea, whatever you stupid nerd. Pelinal also cursed a different Aelid Lord to prevent him from resurrecting, showing that he's got some brains to match all that brawn. Now I admit, I'd perhaps slightly exaggerated about him killing every single elven chieftain and leader in the east of Cyrodiil. What really happened is he killed a bunch of them, and then within the span of a year, actually wiped them all out at the head of Elysia's armies. Which, honestly, is more impressive. Off-screen kills are always kind of vague, and detractors of Whitestrake might say it actually took decades because of how super awesome the elves are. But this took a measly year. One year in the eastern portion of Cyrodiil is certifiably elf-free. That's the Palinal guarantee. He simply could not be stopped. Any elven weapon that managed to hit him just didn't work, and soon enough he had slaughtered his way to northern Cyrodiil. Alessia had sent messengers to Skyrim asking for help, and when they finally made it to Pelinal, presumably by following the trail of burning cities and bodies, his hair had been stained brown with elf blood. Is that how that works? I don't know, but it's awesome. He wears a helmet too, which is the really impressive part. Complete coverage of his head, and he still killed so many elves he stained his hair from it. Upon seeing him, the Nord said that their god Shore had returned to deliver them from the elves, and here's where I'd like to take a break from the story to tell you a bit about Pelinal himself. Pelinal did not like gods. He disliked elves the most, but gods were second place in the competition of things Pelinal Whitestrake would like to not exist. In third place were people that called Pelinal a god, or compared him to god, or said the words oh my god in an expression of surprise around him. 
One dude named Plantinu, which as an aside, I guess it wasn't only the elves of the first era who had a monopoly on stupid names, had the balls to suggest that Pelinor was the Shezarine, the incarnation of the god Shezar, also known as Shor, or Lorcan, or that dude whose heart spawned a whole lot of AI voice memes. Plantinu was later smothered by moths in his sleep, an insect that is closely related to the dead god. No, of course, strictly speaking, this could have been a coincidence. Maybe Shor happened to not like that guy in particular. Just like it's a massive coincidence that Lorcan is also missing his heart and is doomed to wander the lands of Nern as punishment. And surely it is further coincidence that Lorcan in just about all of his incarnations is a sort of patron god of man specifically. But yeah, Pelinal didn't like when you called him out on being of a divine nature. Most people he would just kill with his hands rather than moths, but either way, don't say he's a god when he's in earshot. So to get back to the story, Pelinal was rather unpleased with these Nords for calling him that, and spat on the ground in front of them and chewed them out for profaning that name. Which rather throws a wrench into things, because does he really hate gods? Or does he just hate being compared to them? Lorcan's track record with the rest of the gods ends with them ripping his heart out and shooting it into the planet after all. Some bad blood is understandable. Regardless, he apparently decided in this instance that going to kill more elves was more important than killing this group of Nords, so Pelinal took them to Western Cyrodiil to assist in driving the remaining A-leads towards the center of the province. I've said a lot about how much Palinol dislikes certain things, and compared to both Doom Guy and a Cornet Berserker. You may be wondering if he's just another character like that, whose likes start and end with brutal murder, but such is not the case. Pelinal wasn't a fan of much, but he did have a few people that were close companions of his. First among them is Alessia, who Pelinol greatly respected. He regarded her as being a woman of action, and in fact she was one of the only people who was allowed to remark upon him being anything but mortal as she could back up what she said. His exact words were that Alicia enacts rather than talks, as language without exertion is dead witness. I'm assuming that means that Alicia doesn't just spout bullshit and puts her money where her mouth is, but whatever you want to imagine that line is meaning, it's clear Pelinal held her in high regard. You might also notice that I keep switching how I say her name throughout the video. That's because you all make fun of me for how I pronounce things, so I might as well do it on purpose this time. Next up is Morahouse, the bull man that Alicia had a kid with. Morahouse was considered by Pelinol to be his nephew. Whether or not this is literally the case is left unclear, and the author of the Song of Pelinol books mentions that it might have just been for divine shits and giggles they considered each other as uncle and nephew. But regardless, they were close. They fought alongside one another in combat frequently, and Pelinol held his prowess as a warrior in especially high regard, as he would never instruct the bull man on how to fight or lead. And if Pelinol Whitestrike says you're hot shit, you're probably hot shit. Morahouse was the only being who was not only allowed to talk about Pelinol being a god, but who Pelinol also admitted to his divine nature to. The specific conversation mentioned in the song is about Pelinol warning Morahouse not to fall in love with Alacia, as when gods fall in love, they can change the world and not necessarily for the better. Which is a wonderful bit of hypocrisy from the divine cyborg, as we come to the third major character Pelinol is close with. The hoplite named Huna, a man who Pelinol rescued from slavery and trained to be a warrior. He was also Pelinol's boyfriend. I guess since they couldn't have kids, this time it was alright. No doubt Pelinol was undertaking some gold medal winning mental gymnastics to justify this while also telling Morahouse he couldn't sleep with Alicia. Or maybe he was just weirded out by the whole bull fucking a woman thing, but didn't want to be too on the nose about it. Tragically for Pelinol and Huna, but wonderfully for everyone who wants to see elven heads on pikes, Huna was killed in combat against the A-leads, and now we get to the really fun stuff. Because Huna's death sparked the first of what is simply called Pelinol's madness. Before this, Pelinol liked killing elves. No doubt when he was in the thick of combat, he was having the time of his life, but there was a method to it. Like I said, he hunted down enemy champions specifically, there was clearly thought put into who he was slaying. During a bout of his madness, however, there was nothing but murder on his mind. See elf? Kill elf. See many elf, kill many elf. See a kingdom of elves, kill a kingdom of elves. Whereas once he was going out of his way to just kill champions, now the entire elven army was in his crosshairs while everyone he was theoretically commanding sat back in horror as he turned tens of thousands of elves into chunky salsa. Doom Guy for Elves has finally come out to truly shine. He would even shout out to Akatosh and say that he did this for their shared madness, and said that he saw Akatosh watching him watch Akatosh. Although I do have to wonder if Pelinol was watching Akatosh watch Pelinol watch Akatosh watch Pelinol watch Akatosh. The Song of Pelinol says that he reduced entire swaths of land to void when he entered his madness, and in the Elder Scrolls, that is a very significant choice of phrasing. Without getting into too much of an explanation on that one, to me that signifies he didn't just destroy those lands, he removed them from existence entirely. A whole countryside retconned out of reality by someone in the setting. 
When this happened, there was no single being on Nern that could calm him down. Not Mora House, not Alicia, not the ghost of his dead boyfriend. I don't think Yuna ever actually tried to calm him down from beyond the grave, but if he did, it didn't work. Kinnereth herself would have to wash away the blood from elven camps with rain, because otherwise there was no removing the level of gore that Pelinal left behind. And indeed, it was only when Alicia prayed to the Eight Divines as a whole to calm Pennell down that he would ever stop his rampaging. It took the entirety of the main Elder Scrolls pantheon just to calm this one guy the fuck down. And this wasn't just a one-time thing, he would regularly go berserk and start turning the jungle of Cyrodiil into a barren wasteland. Alicia had to go to lengths to appease the Divines because they nearly left the world in disgust over the sheer amount of rage Pelinal was putting out. At one point, he even butchered a whole bunch of Khajiit because he thought they were a type of elf. They don't have the fondest opinion of him because of this. I doubt he really cared one way or the other about what they thought about him, though. They are just lucky he didn't go south and elsewhere. One warrior who witnessed Palinol's madness asked him how he felt during it over a few drinks, and he responded that it felt like when the dream no longer needed its dreamer. What another interesting choice of words, given the nature of this setting. And hey, it adds something else to the list of things Palinol likes. Beer. In spite of his complete insanity, or perhaps because of it, Palino and Alicia's forces had over time driven the Aelids towards the center of Cyrodiil and into the area around the White Gold Tower. In an interesting turn of events, Pelinal found himself challenged by the greatest champions the Aelids had left to offer, Umaril, a demigod of the Aelids' own. I hope you remember how I said that the Daedra worshippers won the Aelid Civil War because Umaril was half Daedra. Surely enough for someone like that, he summoned servants of Meridia, Aurorans, to aid him in battle. He called out to Pelinol to face him in combat, and Pelinol was all too happy to oblige. Alicia and her soldiers, as well as the Nords, were rather less eager, however. They knew this would be the biggest battle of the war yet, and they weren't exactly keen to storm in the magical tower filled with elves and demons. Alicia and her council wanted to take a rather more thought out and cautious approach. Care to take a guess what you think Pelinal did in response to this suggestion? If you said he called everyone a pussy and marched in to face the elves himself, you'd be right. All on his own did the White Strike face the Aelid and their minions, and by god was it a slaughter. Every elf or demon that crossed his path was cut to ribbons. While the text doesn't specifically say it was the case, I imagine the White Gold Tower was given a new coat of red paint that day. But this time, things were different. While he was still murdering elves left and right, our hero was slowly but surely being wounded by the weapons that they wielded. Umaril had made sure to forge only the most deadly weapons against the Crusader, and they were wearing him down. Only when the majority of the elves and Aurorans present were slain did Umaro finally come to face Palinol in combat. They had quite the epic battle. They were described as being equally matched. Two warriors of legend come to face each other. An incarnation of the Daedra fighting an incarnation of the creator of the world itself. But for your consideration, Pelinol was more or less crippled and worn down after fighting through an entire army all by himself. For those of you inclined to Warhammer comparisons, which given my usual content I imagine is most of you, this was like Sanguinius fighting Horus after days of constant battle. But unlike Sanguinius, Pelinol finished the job. Because the rage the Primarch of the Blood Angels felt was nothing compared to the rage Pelinol felt when confronted with a person with knives for ears. Pelinol ripped off Amaral's wings and killed him dead. Just to rub salt in the wound, he called Amaral's helmet the ugliest thing he'd ever seen and said his ancestors must have all been bitches to end up siring such a worthless being as Amaril was. And the last remaining A-lead kings facing the Crusader, who until now had presumably been busy quietly shitting their pants in the corner, flew into a rage and cut the weakened Crusader into eight pieces. His dying screams were heard by Alacia and her war council, and with the blowing of Morahouse's war horn, they stormed the gates and slew any elves they could find. Which wasn't many, because all they really saw were a few elves who had already started running away, and a whole lot of corpses. Morahouse found what was left of Pelinol, but because cutting this man's head off only started the process of him dying, they had a long talk about things that only Morahouse would ever know. Pelinol warned Morahouse that Amaro was not truly dead and would one day return, and that no longer could he protect mankind from his wrath. Despite this, Alacia's slave rebellion was successful, and no small part because Pelinol's kill count was at least equal to that of the rest of the army combined. And after that last conversation with his nephew, Palinol Whitestrake finally died. The Chezerine knew peace, and could dream forevermore. Except no, he couldn't quite yet, because apparently he was present at Alacia's deathbed. And because of that goddamn time-traveling thing, I have no idea how this works. Was it his ghost? Did Lorcan manifest as Palinol one last time, just so Alicia could die with a familiar face by her side? Did he stop by her deathbed first, before he traveled back in time? Was Michael Kirkbride mainlining LSD when he wrote this? I give up. You need a damn degree in Elder Scrollsology to understand what's happening half the time. This is beyond me. 
I'm pretty sure the only reason we definitively know he's a cyborg is because Michael Kirkbride called him a swarm foam war fractal from the future in a blog post once. And before you ask, no, I don't know what that means either. Regardless, he shows back up in Oblivion as an actual spirit this time, helps the hero of Kavach out by showing him a location of a shrine his friends built for him, and Amaru is finally defeated once and for all. Turns out, you needed the full nine divines to kill him for good. Eight wasn't cutting it. Thank you, Talos, for once again being the best god. Now before I stop talking about this guy, I want to take a look at one thing he said in particular. That line about the dream no longer needing its dreamer. There's a few ways you can interpret that, and I promise I only stole one of them off of someone's Reddit explanation of the line. The most mundane possibility, and the one that I'm stealing, is that the line refers only to Pelinal's madness. That once he enters that state, it's self-perpetuating. The dream is his madness, and it no longer needs any input from Pelinal to keep going. That is to say, he no longer has to want to kill elves to keep killing elves, as his madness exists for one reason alone, and that's to kill every elf on the planet. It's the least interesting explanation in my opinion, but it's also the one that leads to the most elf murder, and in the Elder Scrolls, that's something I support. And it would explain why the gods themselves were needed to calm him down. He was incapable of doing it himself. Nothing short of divine intervention would snap him out of his trance. The second explanation is one that you could probably see coming a mile away. Chim. The whole thing about realizing the Elder Scrolls is a dream of a sleeping being known as the Godhead, and gaining god powers from that as you start lucid dreaming. That's a very simplified explanation, because going into more would extend this video's length by about three hours, but that's the gist of it. And it's by no means a hard connection to make. When you start delving into the subject of dreams and whatnot with Elder Scrolls lore, Chim is always looming in the background waiting to make everything confusing. Originally, I had an explanation for the specifics of how Chim and Pelena were potentially related, but upon rereading it, I realized my explanation sucked and deleted it. So I'm just gonna throw Chim in your face and hope you can figure out how to make sense of it. Quality YouTube work right here. But personally, I believe something else. I think it still has to do with Lorcan, but I don't think it has anything to do with Chim. Lorcan in many of his incarnations is a god of men. Perhaps the dream was not Nurn and Mundus, not Chim, but Lorcan's desire for mankind to be able to prosper without his interference. With Pelinal's madness pretty much clearing Cyrodiil of all the elves that would see mankind kept subjugated, this dream no longer needed its dreamer. Mankind no longer needed a Shezarine, and by extension Pelinal, to keep itself safe. He single-handedly slaughtered his way to a brighter future for mankind, and his dream could now be free without him any longer being needed. Or maybe I'm entirely wrong. That's the fun thing about Elder Scrolls lore, it's very interpretive. And not interpretive in the GW way, where everything might be true, but might also just be in-universe propaganda because the company wants to have a cop-out for everything that might annoy people. It's interpretive in a there's generally no single right answer kind of way. So maybe I'm overthinking it, or maybe I'm underthinking it. I suppose the truth of that theory ultimately depends on whether or not you like my answer. And I talk out of my ass quite a lot, so I understand if you don't like the answer. Either way, thus finally ends the tale of Pelinal Whitestrake. May he rest easy for all time, knowing he did more to kill elves than any other being in fiction. Except maybe Slanesh, but that's cheating. As always, thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the mace of the crusader to my Pelinal Whitestrake, letting me bash Myrrh in their dumb, stupid, fuckhead faces to my heart's content. May your blades never dry of Altmer blood, my companions. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there.